back, everyone. Please let me introduce Dr. Shelby Harris, who is a psychologist and sleep specialist in private practice in New York. She is board certified in behavioral sleep medicine and treats a wide variety of sleep, anxiety, and depression issues using evidence-based non-medication treatments. In addition to her self-help book, The Woman's Guide to Overcoming Insomnia, Dr. Harris is a clinical associate professor at the Albert, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Neurology and Psycho Psychiatry. Before going into private practice, she was, in long, she was the long-standing director of the insomnia program at the Montefiore Sleep Center in New York City. Dr. Harris has been an invited columnist for the New York Times and is frequently in the media, including the New Yorker, Washington Post, CBS Mornings, The Today Show, Good Morning America, and The Drew Barrymore Show. Dr. Harris can be found on Instagram at sleep.shelby, where she provides evidence-based information about sleep wellness and sleep disorders. Thank you. Hello and welcome. So I am, like um, Claire just said, I'm a clinical psychologist in New York, and I do a lot of work with patients all across the spectrum when it comes to um, sleep disorders. So one of the things, and I've been in practice for about 20 years now, and one of the things that has been newer that I think people have been asking me about a lot recently is like, can you talk about CBT for hypersomnia? Can you talk about it? Because what, when we think about sleep disorders, the thing that we think about a lot when it comes to CBT is CBT for insomnia. We have tons of data. It's been around for a long time. Um, but we haven't really done a lot with CBT for other areas. So the hypersomnia area is an interesting one that we're really starting to do more research on, a little bit. I mean, trying to come up with a unified protocol a bit. So, um, and then that's where I'm located. And like I said, if you want, if you do, shameless plug, if you do anything on in, online, I do a lot of stuff on Instagram. So if you have any patients, any family members, anybody, Follow me there, and I do a QA and a every week, too, so I can kind of guide people towards proper treatment, because as we all know, there's a lot out there that is misinformation. So the initial study that was really done for CBT for hypersomnia was by my friend and colleague, Jason Ong, and um, some of his colleagues, and it was done, it was published in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine in 2020, so it was an initial feasibility study that looked at hypersomnia um, treatment with telehealth. So it's kind of ahead, a little bit of ahead of its time, I'd say. Now, I mean, I would say my practice is 98% telehealth. So it's changed, but we're really trying to do more telehealth. So if we look at hypersomnia and depression, about people, patients with hypersomnia encompass about five to 10% of patients who present to a sleep disorder center, a sleep clinic. Um, in the population, as many of us know, about 0 0.025 to 0 0.16 of the general population has hypersomnia. And studies have shown that as high as of, uh, almost 60% of patients with hypersomnia have at least, at least mild depression. So symptoms of feeling down, depressed most of the day, nearly every day for at least two weeks, and then multiple other symptoms on top of that, lack of interest in things you normally enjoy, changes of an appetite, changes in attention. So we find that at least 60% of those patients have some sort of depression, and 25% had moderate to severe depression. Um, but here's the thing, is that despite such a prevalence of patients that are coming to sleep clinics with hypersomnia and the levels of depression that are happening in these clinics and in these patients, we really didn't have good ways of kind of addressing it. I mean, I was at Montefiore for many years, and we were lucky in that I was there as a clinical psychologist. We had um, Michael Thorpe and Mita Goswami, who was amazing and did a lot of stuff with the Narcolepsy Institute, but most sleep centers do not have those sorts of research sources. So this protocol was developed to really not just address issues with sleepiness, but also to address issues with mood, with self-efficacy. So, Past research that was really done, there were protocols that looked at patients with narcolepsy a lot of the time. They really looked at how to work on the hypersomnia aspect, so to work on scheduled naps, to work on nighttime sleep, to try and 
get more sleep or consolidate whenever possible sleep that was happening. But really things were, protocols or at least studies weren't looking so much at health-related quality of life issues. So Dr. Ong and his colleagues decided to really try and have CBTH for hypersomnia work to combine the hypersomnia issues as well as any social issues, um, mood issues, and to really come up with a more a comprehensive model. And when we say in CBT, a lot of treatments in cognitive behavior therapy look at, they use these mod models, they have these programs. So there can be things for panic disorder, there can be ones for social anxiety, for depression, for obsessive compulsive disorder. And a lot of them have different treatment targets, different treatment techniques that are involved in them. And then on top of that, we still use flexibility. So I think one of the downsides that people, when they think about cognitive behavior therapy, they think it's very rigid and protocol driven. And yes, to a, a certain extent, there is a protocol, but there is flexibility within it. And that was kind of the goal with coming up with this, is that you don't have to do every single thing. So what we're looking at is really looking with this protocol, looking at patients with all different types of uh, central disorders of hypersomnia. So not just narcolepsy, because a lot of the older research really just looked at narcolepsy. So let's talk about some of the game, the, the goals of CBT for hypersomnia. So it's really working on helping with any of the hypersomnia symptoms, if possible, help, helping to improve self-efficacy, self-esteem, given that there's a lot of unpredictability that happens when it comes to hypersomnolence, and then also to have more generalizability with the central disorders of hypersomnolence. So not just narcolepsy, but looking at narcolepsy type 1, 2, as well as idiop idiopathic hypersomnia. So the general format in the actual manualized program that was in that feasibility study, and like I said, this is early on. We still need more research behind this, but it is a really lovely kind of way of coming up with a, a more centralized way of dealing with a lot of the things that we've been, we've kind of been doing ourselves in behavioral sleep medicine for years, but it's a really nice thing, uh, way to, I would say, put it all together so that someone who might not have as much training in this area can really start to utilize this with their patients. So it's the ideal, like I said, there's still flexibility, is six one-hour sessions. And the beauty of it is it can be done in groups or it can be done individual. And if you look at the manual, it, it's totally lovely in that you can do both ways. And it also works really nice over telehealth. Um, and then, like I said, there's flexibility. So the first session, and this is kind of standard when it comes to all cognitive behavior therapy, and I am a firm believer in this, is that you have to understand what you're dealing with as a patient in order to want to even know where to go with treatment. I think a lot of times in older psychothe uh, psychotherapy models, and I'm from New York City where like analysis reigned supreme for a long time, like we, you, you didn't know your disorder, you didn't know your diagnosis, you didn't know the treatment plan, and that is not a thing with CBT. First session, after you have your assessment um, and you've, you come, we kind of figure out what's going on, you learn what is hypersomnolence, what is narcolepsy, what is idiopathic hypersomnia, what are the different um, symptoms that come with it. What about diagnosis, right? How long can it take for some people to actually get diagnosed with some of these issues, right? We know that, thank goodness, because of all the advocacy and awareness that's out there now, the time to diagnosis is lessening, but it's still not great. So learning about that, also learning about um, different treatment options for hypersomnia. So understanding what it is that you are dealing with is the initial thing that we always do. So we call it psychoeducation. And another tenant in CBT, love it or hate it, is homework. So I always say to every single patient of mine, like, you're in here for 30, 45, 60 minutes, once a week, once every two weeks. How many more hours are you living your life out there? We need to learn to have, we need to have you generalize these strategies to your life outside of these sessions. So homework is really, really important, CBT. Um, so that is built into this program as well. So the first session really is education. I give to almost every patient of mine, I give resources, I give handouts um, about what's, what various issues that we're dealing with, the disorders that we're dealing with are, so that they have something tangible to actually look at. Now the second session, um, and when I was talking with Dr. Ong, Jason Ong, who was uh, one of the, the 
people, or, uh, people on the paper and really developed the protocol, he said this module, and he's a true CBTR at heart as well, this module was one of the most interesting ones of him uh, that he found when he was doing with patients, and that it really was talking about what was it like for you to be diagnosed? What was that experience like? What does it mean for you to have hypersomnia? To really, and think about talking about this with one person, with a therapist, but talking about it in a group format, right? How does this reflect you and your life? How does it reflect you as a person? What was your life like before you had the diagnosis of whatever type of um, central disorder of hypersomnia that you have? What changed when you were given this diagnosis? How about talking about family? And how do your family and your friends, how has that changed in relation to once you have this diagnosis? And then there's another module at the end that talks more about disclosure of symptoms and when to disclose and should you disclose. But for people who already know, how did that change? So really, if you're in a group format, this is more of the more traditional therapy of like processing, trying to figure out, understanding the disorder itself and how it's impacting you in your life. All right, and then at the end of the session, we have more homework that's given. So this is a good example of um, homework of a sleep diary. So like Dr. Graner was just talking about, sleep diaries are great. They are not the end all be all, right? So then we do sometimes use trackers, but this is one of those times where when it comes to hypersomnia, we do try to use a diary more, more often than not. I'm not sure how well this comes up. So this was um, Dr. Ong's and his protocol initially. Um, there's a gazillion different sleep diaries out there. Most of them are more focused on, to use the term of the moment that everyone loves to say, optimizing your sleep or getting for work for insomnia. This one was really developed more to look at mood and hypersomnia and napping, because a lot of the diaries don't always capture that as much. So if you can see on here, we have the day, the date, you'd put that in, obviously. Time you got up for the day. This, and this is interesting, because it doesn't look at kind of broken sleep throughout the night. So time you got up for the day, morning activities, and medication. I think the medication piece and the timing that you take medication is really, really key, and I think it can be really helpful in working with patients to come up with understanding how they're taking their medication and when. The naps, time for the nap, total sleep time during that time, activities in the afternoon, Nap, same thing, evening activities, nap again, if at all, and then um, time you went to bed, and then time, your total sleep time for the night. So we're really focusing more on the daytime um, and napping, more so than what the nighttime itself is looking like, aside from total sleep time that you're getting. So session three are, is really now thinking about structured daytime activities. So if someone comes in and now they've, for their week, they've done their sleep diary, I can look at the diary now and get a good sense as to what's been going on, right? Is there any consistency, any patterns emerging? Is there any pattern with when they might be napping during the day, the amount of time that napping's happening with medication? Um, what about nighttime sleep? So is there any routine with when sleep is happening at night? Are they kind of all over the place? with what time they go to bed or wake up. Is there any issue with, say, shift work, anything like that that's uh, falling in here that we have to think about as well? So let's now think about structuring the daytime activities here. So the first thing we think about is structuring naps whenever possible. And also we have to think about the realities of this when it comes to work, talking with employers, trying to build in naps. There's all that aspect that we will talk about in a later session. And then what we also build in is the idea of the Pomodoro technique. Who here has heard of the Pomodoro technique? Ah, a number of people. Um, so the Pomodoro technique is, you know, I'll get to that in a second. I have that on the next slide. So then there's also, we think about nurturing and depleting activities. So that's something when someone has a sleep diary, when they're talking about the different activities they might be doing at diff different times of the day, I eventually have them write in N for nurturing and D, depleting. So what are things that are building towards you feeling like you're building towards doing something that are um, masterful for you that you feel like are nurturing your life? What are things that are depleting of your energy? 
is the D. So we want to see a balance or trying to increase and reduce as much as possible. I mean, it's, un it's unrealistic to have a life with no depleting activities, right? But to try and increase those nurturing activities as much as possible is something that we build in more. So we have that, and then the other big piece, and I'll get to Pomodoro in a second, is the behavioral activation. So this was built in really for the depression piece. Right? So behavioral activation, when it comes to depression treatment, is one of the hallmark treatments. The thing that I start with almost every single patient in mind when I'm doing um, treatment for depression. And given the rates of depression in patients with hypersomnia, we want to start doing some behavioral activation. So the idea of behavioral activation is that you want to find a mix of activities that are both pleasure, that, that increase pleasure for you, but also make you feel some sort of mastery. So for one person, that could be watching TV. So hear me out on this. TV for some people, I mean, let's think about what you might be watching. But if you're like watching reality TV all day long, that might be enjoyable to you, but are you feeling any sense of accomplishment from it? Versus maybe some sort of like a drama that's hard to follow. Maybe you actually do get, or a I don't know, a documentary that's really interesting. Maybe you get a sense of enjoyment and also a sense of pleasure out of that. So you want to think of activities that do that mix. It could be something as small as painting your nails, right? It doesn't have to be a big sweeping thing. But in depression treatment, we always try to build in one activity a day, small, big, whatever it is, to help increase that mix of um, mastery and pleasure, because that is the first thing that we see starts to decrease in patients with depression. They stop doing or they start to lessen the amount of things they're doing that are getting in the way of them feeling pleasure as well as a sense of accomplishment. It's that magical mix that's really important. So that's stuff that we might start to problem solve with someone. Well, what are some activities that might be that mix for you that we can build in one a day where you, do, where you can do that? Start small. Right, really start small. And then once you build on those things, you start to, the, the bar gets a little bit higher. It changes your mood. One of the things that we always think about in depression treatment is that a lot of times I'll say to like cognitive behavior therapy, you have your thoughts, you have your behaviors, and you have your emotions. And I'll say to everyone, like, I'll say to a patient, like, what's the easiest thing here to change? And sometimes people will say, oh, the way I feel. I say, really? You can just change how you feel? Like, snap out of it. Don't feel depressed anymore. It doesn't really work that way. It's a lot easier to change your behavior first, some small behaviors. And the more you do that, believe it or not, it starts to impact how you think and how you feel. So we start with these things small. And that's stuff that you might want to add on to a diary for someone to put on the back. Say, here are a mix of different activities I want you to build in. So then you can see, as they continue to do the diary, you can see, are they mixing in that behavioral activation every single day? Could be going for a walk, sitting by the window. Doesn't matter what it is. For, for that person, it has to be that magic mix. So a Pomodoro technique is originally, the person who came up with it was literally had a little tomato timer. So it looked like Pomodoro. That's where the whole name comes from. But it was all about ADHD focus, um, or to help with focus for patients with ADHD and just who had time management strategy issues. So it was really about breaking up your time on tasks you have to do into 25-minute periods. So really focusing for those 25-minute periods, setting a timer. When those 25 minutes are done, you take a break for five minutes. After, and that's considered a Pomodoro, 30 minutes, right? After four of those, you get a longer break. And so what Dr. Ong and his colleagues thought about is how can we incorporate this into thinking when it comes to hypersomnia? So now it's about thinking about naps and daytime structure. So could it be I'm going to focus on doing these things in these, these um, sh sections of time, right? Like that sleep diary has. It has daytime, mor late morning activities, afternoon activities, evening activities, and then a nap. So if you're someone who needs to nap, if you have to figure out the timing of the nap, that is essentially the, what you would do at, at the end of a Pomodoro. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a different way of thinking about it. You could combine it with the traditional way of doing a Pomodoro for sure. That works as well if you want to do both. But we think about it as structured time of activity with a nap for a, a complete Pomodoro. 
So the next piece is thinking about structured nighttime activities. So we think about, we use those sleep-wake diaries again. So instead of focusing as much on the wake stuff, right, with the napping schedule, really trying to optimize that for the patient, we now think about nighttime, right? So how can we help get them more structure? Consistency at nighttime is really important. So is someone really going to bed within around the same time, an hour or so, every night, getting up around the same time? What are the, the challenges that get in the way of you doing that? Right? I think it's very easy to say to someone, go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time every day. But problem solving it is really important. right? So if do you have to get up super, super early twice a week to catch a train to go pretty far into to the city or something for work. How can we come up with a compromise here and get it to work so it's working where you're getting enough nighttime sleep on a regular basis to help make sure that we can maximize what we're trying to do during the daytime? So that's one of the big pieces, is the regularity and enough of the nighttime sleep. And then the other big piece is sleep hygiene, right? Sleep hygiene, you notice it's not in the first session, right? I, we talk about this in insomnia work all the time. Like sleep hygiene is often the control group for a lot of studies. Sleep hygiene is important though, right? If you're drinking a lot of alcohol before going to bed, it's probably going to worsen how you're going to feel during the day. But it's not the initial thing that we're focusing on. We're focusing on other things, but also making sure that we're working on sleep hygiene. We're working on things like caffeine use, being thoughtful about how you're using it so it's not then negatively impacting any nighttime sleep that you're getting. And then the next piece that we build in is coping skills and emotion regulation. So this is another piece that, as you can imagine, is focused more on the mood, right? So we've got, we're going between sleep, daytime sleepiness, and mood. We're really trying to be as comprehensive as possible. And these are the, the, one of the other hallmarks of CBT, and I think this gets a bad rap a lot of times. I'm seeing this go around on social media a lot, too, is that people think that CBT is all positive thinking that it's all fine. And that couldn't be further from the truth. CBT, the cognitive part, is thinking about what are the things that you're literally thinking about. And is there, are they based in evidence? Are they based in reality? Are these actual problems? To live a life that's problem free would be wonderful, but good luck with that. So it's about thinking, are these things that actually have solutions to them or steps towards a solution that we can do? Or are these things that we need to work on our acceptance or our ways of managing our emotion in relation to these things? Right? So we have to kind of be realistic and then see what can we accept or move towards acceptance with, and then what can we actually come up with a solution or try to work on a solution for. So one of the first things is mindfulness. So who here has, uh, uh, who here has heard of mindfulness? I'm assuming most people, okay, good. Who here has any sort of a routine mindfulness practice, be it two minutes or more? Yeah, that's, everyone knows about mindfulness, so few people do it routinely. My mindfulness, literally every morning, I talk about this all the time, and I started doing this before the apps or anything really existed, and an iPhone even existed. I, 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 ha, I live in the woods outside of New York City, and I look when it's light enough out. Every morning I get up and I spend two minutes looking out my window, observing and describing what I see on the trees. That's it. And when my mind goes to, oh, there's ice on the trees, are they going to cancel school? How am I going to deal with school being canceled? And what am I going to do? Nope. Just observe and describe. Observe and describe. So it's about noticing that your mind, it's not about focusing the whole time. Mindfulness is about observing when your mind wanders and saying, nope, back on track. Nope, back on track. And it's about every time you wander and get back on track, that's like going to the gym and doing a strength rep. Your brain gets stronger at being able to let go and get back on track. And that is a huge thing. I think a lot of people use mindfulness, at least in the sleep world, to try and sleep too or to go to sleep using it. You're actually, it's like falling asleep while doing a bench press at the gym. You're not getting the exercise out of it. So it's about letting go and getting back on whatever it is you're doing in the moment. So if you're thinking about motion-focused coping, right, if you're starting to feel any sort of emotion that's not serving you in that moment, that's, there's nothing you can do about it in that moment, practicing mindfulness daily for even two, three minutes every day helps you to get better at saying, this is not serving me now. Let it go. Let it go. And to keep doing that. And then the other thing that we build in a lot is uh, worry time. Has anybody here heard about worry time? 
So worry time, we use it a lot in anxiety and insomnia, but I love it as a strategy. It's so fantastic. The name, I think, could use some improvement. Um, so the idea of worry time is if I said to everyone here, don't, don't think about it, don't. But the, don't. There's a pink elephant, don't. He's behind you, and he's wearing a tutu. Don't think about it. Everyone's thinking about a pink elephant, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. So with worry, when we try to say, don't think about it, stop pushing it away, all it's going to do, it's like that whack-a-mole game at a carnival. It just keeps popping up saying, think about me, think about me. So what we do with worry time is we say, instead of saying, don't think about this, we say, oh, we're going to let you think about it for 20 minutes every single day. You can do it in the evening. I don't usually do it right before bed. But do it any point during the day for 20 minutes every single day. And you take out a piece of paper. And there's different ways to do it. I'm just being mindful of time. There's different ways to do it. But it's essentially writing down anything and everything that's a worry. And then the other way to do it is you can write all the worries on one side, anything. Don't judge yourself for your worries. And then on the other side, it's writing what's the next step. It might not be to solve the problem, but it's what's the next step. So it could be, there's nothing I can do about this. I need to let it go. It could be, I'm going to work on getting more structured with whatever it is I have to do tomorrow. I'm going to build in one activity for myself. So it's just the next step. And then you put the paper away when the 20-minute buzzer goes off. And then any time, those 23 hours and 40 minutes for the rest of the day that your brain's going, think about me, think about me, you say, here's the key, not now, during worry time. So instead of saying, don't think of the pink elephant, you're saying, I'll think of you, but I'm going to think of you during this time. And the more that you practice that, believe it or not, it actually helps to reduce the kind of worry that's just kind of happening all over the time. And if you do that, plus some mindfulness, it can really be a lot it's not perfect, but it can get easier to soften the anxiety over time. And then the final session that we do is social support. And this is what I think when I was working with Dr. Goswami, she was really wonderful with this. She did a lot of, um, she had a lot of resources for um, legal issues, for disability, for assertive communication. And I think nowadays we have the, um, the uh, Idiopathic Hypersomnia Foundation. We have so many amazing, Project Sleep, we have so many amazing resources out there that those are the things that we share in that session. We talk about when to disclose. And even the manual has like discussion points of how to actually go through um, when do you want to disclose to someone, an employer, or even starting to date someone, right? Having that conversation with someone about your hypersomnia. Is it worth to having that conversation early on? So we really do go through that discussion with patients as well. So it's really, um, and even support animals we have on there, for, especially for like patients with cataplexy, right? That can be really useful for some patients. So really talking about all the different social supports, organizational supports, um, governmental supports that we have is really important to um, help with patients. And then, like I said, medical, legal, occupational issues, that's when we will really discuss it. So as you can see, just as a brief overview for um, CBT for hypersomnia, we're talking about mood issues, we're talking about sleep at night, organizing, coming up with better structure for sleep during the day, and then also social occupational issues as well. So it's a much more comprehensive way of working behaviorally with patients than we had in the past. It was kind of very piecemeal, and people, we would just kind of, one patient, we would discuss these things and whatever with whatever patients that would be in front of us. This is a much more comprehensive way to do it, and it works really, it work, seems to work really nicely in groups and over telehealth. So as I wrap up, any questions, thoughts? Yeah. Oh, I see you there, and we have one over there. Hi, thank you for this. Um, You're so. I'm a therapist and I'm also in therapy. So I'm just wondering, um, what's the best way to, like if you're already doing CBT and working with a therapist, share about CBTH with them? And yeah. are there any like resources for practitioners to learn how to implement it themselves? Wonderful question. So what I actually do a lot in my practice, because as most of us know, hypersomnia issues, like s most people aren't trained in them very well. So you can definitely send them to any of the organizations. They're great. But what I do in my practice a lot is I actually will consult with someone who has a therapist already. So I would be, sometimes it depends upon the person, I'll just do, I, I will do like one or two sessions with that actual therapist, so like almost as a supervisor. 
Um, sometimes people just consult with me for a quick session just to get a sense. I do a lot of education of like what, are, what is considered depression, what is considered like some narcolepsy, and symptoms like the vivid dreaming, the high, you know, hallucinations, any of that sort of stuff. A lot of education needs to be done. So that's actually a really common way that we'll do it. Yeah. Um, also a clinical therapist here. Ah, hi. Um, hi. Um, just wondering, is this published protocol that I can purchase for, for actual practice? Um, not yet that I know of, but if you look at the feasibility study and also if you contact me or you look up Jason Ong, um, Dr. Ong, will, he usually will share it with people if they're interested in learning more about it. So it's a whole manual that he can share. Yeah. Okay. And um, is this, because there's a lot of through lines with uh, CBT for chronic illness as well. Yes. Is there a particular patient um, handbook or, or workbook that you would recommend? Um, for chronic illness, not really so much that I have, unfortunately. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I think a lot of the societies have. Um, so I know that there's a number of books for practitioners, but I know like, I mean, I know that some of the groups, the uh, support groups, Project Sleep, like a lot of the groups will have stuff for patients as well. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm still kind of formulating the question part of it, but sure. um, just something that's stood out to me is um, putting sleep hygiene later in the program and then um, uh, how it's kind of seen as, like with primary care or even therapists, you know, even, you know, psychother oh, you know psychopharmacologists, yep. everybody kind of treats it almost like first line treatment for mm -hmm. um, hypersomnia, or if, although I feel like it's, rare that, at least in my experience, that they recognize hypersomnia as a unique condition yeah. uh, to begin with. Um, so I think that's really uh, cool. Is there maybe a way to, um, I don't know, I feel like in my life I need a shorthand for, um, like I was at my endocrinologist or was seeing an endocrinologist yeah. for the first time and just explaining my other conditions and I just happened to mention um, hypersomnia and she gave me a lecture on sleep hygiene. Yeah. You know, and I might not go back to that endocrinologist because that was kind of annoying. Um, yeah. How do you, and I know this isn't the focus of this session, but I just, right. because we're here, um, how is there a way to kind of change the, that dialogue a little bit so that it's not so much like, yeah, uh -huh, I know, I know, I've heard all that stuff so that people kind of understand like, no, this is a condition and that is a, and I need a word here for, like, sleep hygiene is not necessarily in a, a treatment. It's not a, but it's a, a what? What is it to, um, in, in the course of Oh, gosh, of I've never treatment. had to think about it as, like, summing it up in a word. Michael, do you have any idea? How would you, what would you use as a word? Adjunctive? Yeah, I mean. I mean Exactly, and I think it's like a lot of times the hypersomnia stuff, all the sleep hygiene recommendations, yes, limiting alcohol, limiting caffeine, but those, those sleep hygiene are really like for the person who has the occasional insomnia here and there. Like hygiene is brushing your teeth. Yes. Everyone should brush their teeth, you can't brush your way out of braces. Exactly. Advice about brushing your teeth better is it gonna help you. Yeah, exactly. So that's something that we need to think about, but I think the other thing too that we're trying to do a lot in, that we're slow to do and it's hard is in sleep medicine, we're trying to get the education out there about sleep hygiene being important. You gotta brush and floss every day, but it's not the, the treatment for most sleep disorders. That, I mean, the number of times I can count on my hands of someone who came to me and the problem was because they were drinking Diet Coke right before bed is like not happening. Yes. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, it's, it's an education issue, unfortunately. And when it comes to hypersomnia, it's an even bigger issue because then it's just knowledge about the disorder to begin with. So I'm one of those people that also experiences insomnia due to just like racing thoughts, anxiety, yeah. laying there in bed, just 
don't think about it, don't think about it, but like what are strategies that you use with your patients to kind of get out of that? And like, you know, sometimes I'm just like, that's it. Like I'm, I'm just kind of done and I slept you know, four hours, or maybe I didn't sleep at all, but I've been laying here for yeah. <laughs> an hour trying to go back to sleep, so I just, I'm like, I'm getting up for the day, and hopefully I can take a nap later kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends, because I don't know all the nuances of what's going on there, but I think when it's the I have to sleep, I have to sleep kind of thought process, I cannot stress mindfulness enough. I really think people say, but I tried it, it didn't help. But it's not the thing where you do it for a day and then it works. Like the best time to start mindfulness was yesterday. So the more that you can do that, and then there's that idea of are you, you know, the whole stimulus control, which applies for hypersomnia also. People are, get very fixated on like, well, I have to get out of bed if I'm awake. If you're trying to force sleep to happen and your brain is like a mile a minute, get out of bed. Just do something else. It might not make you sleepy in that moment, but at least it passes the time so you're not trying to force it. But those are the big, and then it's sleep timing and all that sort of stuff and napping. Like there's a bigger picture, but I, I really do think mindfulness gets the most bang for its buck. It's just, as we could say, like so few people do it because it just, it's hard to buy into initially. Oh, last question, I think. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering about the pomelos. Yeah. Um, I have narcolepsy and the idea of having a nap as a reward after doing things is just delicious. Um, but for my friends with IH for whom napping just yes. makes it worse, what kind of things do you do? It could really be anything. It could be just sitting outside, right? It could be whatever it is that might be that, um, I don't want to use the word reward. I don't like the term reward. But I, whatever it is that is a break, a mental break, because with hypersomnia, as we know, it, like you said, it can make them feel worse if you're taking a nap. So it, that's where the flexibility comes into play. Napping is a really hard one to write like a specific protocol for because it really does vary based on the patient. So it could be anything. I mean, I've had patients just literally go outside and sit on their hammock. Um, I've had patients just sit and watch a TV show for a little bit. It's just like that mental break from whatever you're doing as well. So it's finding what works for you to give you that break from whatever. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, so please do follow Dr. Shelby Harris on social media and take a look at her website because there's lots of content and um, it's very consistently posted. So I'm sure you'll find that helpful. <laughs>